uh, so Eric, as you know, the, the, the first, the why we are doing this is uh, stories are really inspiring. And I think first up, what's most important is we'd love to hear your story. I know a little bit. I know you were a journalist uh, uh, with the NPR, but would would love to know a little bit as to how it all evolved, where you grew up, uh, how you decided to go traveling, writing, etc. Oh boy, where to begin? Uh, well, how did we begin when I, when I was five years old and uh, growing up in Baltimore here in the U.S. Uh, on the East Coast, and uh, I decided I was going to run away from home. And I, maybe a lot of five-year-olds uh, talk about running away from home, but I actually did it and got a few miles from my house before the police picked me up. And uh, I guess you could say I've been running ever since. Uh, maybe some might say running away from something, but I would say running towards something. Um, I basically, uh, I'm a traveler and a bit of an amateur philosopher. Um, and I would say uh, my philosophy of life can be summed up by a quote I really liked from the American writer Henry Miller. He once said that when it comes to travel, uh, one's destination is never a place, but a new way of seeing things. And I quite like that quote, and it, it describes, I think, a lot of uh, my philosophy. But long story short, uh, I, I've been traveling uh, in different capacities uh, as just sort of a free spirit. But for most of my life as a foreign correspondent, as you mentioned, for National Public Radio, I was a foreign correspondent. I was based in Delhi, in Jerusalem, in Tokyo, and reported from probably 30 or 40 countries. But... These were not particularly happy places. I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that. And one day I woke up and decided, well, this is kind of silly. What am I doing traveling to just the most miserable places on the planet? What if I spent a year traveling to the happiest places? What would that? What would these places look like? And what could they teach us? What could they teach me about uh, the art of happiness? And uh, my second epiphany was to try to uh, get NPR to pay for me to travel around the world for a year looking for the happiest places. They did not go for it, uh, but a, a great publisher called 12 Books in New York City did go for it and uh, and helped me, and uh, the result is uh, the book, The Geography of Bliss. Okay, and and, and, and how, how long ago was this that you decided to become a writer and... and... And I know you've written another book. Uh, how, 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 like, how, what is the time span we're talking about? Well, you know, I was, I, I, I always had a way with words, uh, and I always wanted to travel. So being a foreign correspondent seemed natural. Uh, I guess, you know, and I, I was a journalist for a good 20 years, most of them with NPR. I also worked for the New York Times for a while. Um, but I, at some point, I, I guess, Rohan, I, I realized the limitations of journalism which is basically that you're constrained, especially in this country, I think even more than the UK, you're constrained by by the facts, you're constrained by uh, this thing called journalistic practice, which means basically you can never really say how you feel about a person or a place, right? So uh, I realize how limiting that can be, and uh, I feel actually quite liberated doing what I do now, which is essentially write books and, and write some magazine articles and travel. Uh, I feel, you know, while I don't have a news organization to fund me as I travel, I have the freedom, for instance, I'm going to Calcutta uh, in a few weeks to, to start researching my next book, and uh, I'll be basically staying by my own dime, on my own dime, and, uh, but have the freedom to stay for as long as I want or as long as I can afford and to to pursue whatever interests me. And if the India coffee house in Calcutta seems like a fascinating place, uh, I can spend days there. Well, when I was a correspondent for, for whatever news organization, your editor is like you say, Eric, what are you doing? You need to get out of that coffee house and go cover that war over here or over there. So, uh, yeah, so I feel like I've truly found uh, my calling a bit later in life, but as they say, better late than never. Yeah. So what was the defining moment? I mean, you know, you, you, so a lot of us are, you know, sometimes you just go through something, you're in a routine and, you know, the routine can go on forever. So there's something that that might have caught, that must have caused you to sort of break out and say, OK, hey, I'm going to write my own book uh, or, or whatever it was. Right. Uh, was it family? What, what, what was the defining moment? Well, you know, I, I, I was one of those people who uh, my problem was not coming up with ideas. It was sort of narrowing them down. So I had lots of uh, ideas for books. Oh my God! Oh, I had notebooks filled with ideas of these things I was going to do, and 
Uh, I was in all places in, in, in Kazakhstan uh, okay. when the idea came to me. Uh, I was there for seven weeks, um, actually for a very different kind of uh, journey. My, my wife and I were uh, adopting our daughter, a baby girl. She was just eight months old at the time. And it required you to stay in the country for seven weeks. I don't know if you've been to Kazakhstan, no. but there's not a lot to do for seven weeks. Okay. So we were just sort of waiting for all the paperwork and everything to be processed. It's taking a long time. And I had a lot of time to think. And that was when this, this idea to write this book came to me. And I, when you have a really good idea, something clicks into place, and you, you just sort of know that it's the right idea. You don't, you don't turn back. And, and that, can be, that can be quite wonderful. Okay, very nice. And and I you know I, I mean, you know th there are so many questions, right? But but f I think one of the things that I'd love to talk about is your next book, uh which I haven't read yet actually. Um you know it it delves into the religious. So that's one of the things that I uh, that's one of the things that I did, that I sort of was wondering about geography of bliss. You never touched faith and 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 um, I mean there was obviously a little bit about spirituality in your time in India. But how did the next uh, next book come along? Well, you know, I, I mean it a subject bigger than happiness. And, and what is bigger than happiness except for God and religion, really? Uh, that's one reason. Uh, another reason is this statistic I came across that I mentioned in Geography of Bliss, just sort of in passing, that people who are religious are happier than people who are not. That's true, yeah. Secular. yeah. And, and why, why is that? Uh, is it because, as my atheist friends like to say, well, ignorance is bliss? Uh, or do the religious know something that the rest of us don't? And I've never been a particularly religious person. I guess I would describe myself as somewhat spiritually curious, but that's about it. And then I, something happened to me, which I describe in the book, uh, the book is called Man Seeks God, My Flirtations with the Divine. Uh, so I finished the Geography of Bliss, I get great pressure, it's submitted the manuscript. And then about a week later, I developed these abdominal pains that were quite severe. Okay. And I was worried, and I went to the hospital, to the emergency room, and they did a bunch of tests, found something funky on my CT scan was the term they used. And I'm really quite scared, and I'm waiting for a specialist to be called in. And a nurse walks into the examination room, and she picks up on my fear, and she leans down, and she whispers in my ear the following words, have you found your God yet? That's what she asked. And long story short, I was not dying. Yeah, I took them three days to determine it really wasn't anything serious at all, but I, I thought I was at the time, and there was that question, have you found your God yet? Uh, <laughs> I suppose in India, you'd have to... Uh, go through 330 million possible gods to answer that question. But, but I, I took her up on the challenge and, uh, and went around the world, as I tend to do, uh, essentially trying on eight different faiths uh, in a serious way, but also, also with a, you know, a good dose of humor. To, I don't take myself too seriously, yeah. uh, but I took the religion seriously that I explored. And, and so the book is an exploration of these eight faiths and, and what it means to be spiritual and religious uh, in, in, in the year 2012. Okay, you know, so, so I think I think the next question is so I, I love the ending of, and I think I'll, I'll speak more about the geography of bliss because I've read the book, of course, and I loved it. I I, I think I'm, there are two 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 parts which I'd like to call out. So one is the ending where you talk about your thesis of happiness, right? So you need money but not too much, um, you know, etc. So how how has writing this changed your life? I know you call yourself a happy grump, uh, but how has this changed your your life well i mean it's changed my life i would say not in like this super dramatic way in that i didn't pick up and move to iceland or bhutan yeah because some people will write to me and say is that the, the lesson from your book we should all move to iceland or, or to bhutan or these other happy places and, and no that's not the point i mean for some people they are what i call hedonic refugees and they really would be happier in india or, or someplace other than the country they were born in but for most of us, that's, that's not in the cards. It's not going to happen. But we can incorporate these these lessons of happiness, these other ways of seeing the world into our, our life. You know, the, the, just as one small example, the Thais uh, have this expression. Well, they have a couple of wonderful expressions. One of them is my pet ride, which means basically uh, never mind, just let it go, uh, which is a, a simple lesson, but one that we, we all struggle with. Another expression the Thais have, and I, I won't attempt to pronounce it in Thai, but it translates in English to, you think too much, or don't think yeah, too much. Yeah, I remember that. And, and this idea that we can actually think too much is alien to many of us, but 
it's something I try to remember, not think about too much, but actually remember when I really get <laughs> trapped inside my own head, which I, I do fairly often. Okay. So I, I guess I picked up lessons from the road about happiness and a way of seeing the world or ways of seeing the world that I try to remember as I, as I go through every day. So I think I think my next question is, is uh, pretty obvious, but are you happy? I'm less unhappy than I was before I wrote the book. Let's put it that way and just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, I know it's it's a loaded question. It's a tough one. It's it's one I know you've asked. You seem you seem pretty happy, Rohan. Are you happy? Yeah, I actually, actually, I am. Uh, you know, it's it's funny. I was uh, just having this discussion with a colleague, and as you know, I was like, oh, you know, I'm interviewing uh, this guy who wrote this book, and she's like, oh, okay, yeah, you seem pretty happy, and uh, and she was like, how was your day? I was like, very busy. She's like, bad busy or good busy? And and uh, I was like, you know, I don't think of things as bad busy. I just think of it as busy or good busy. And she said, you know, you you you're too young. You've not you've not grown old. And I was like, and and you know, my response was a little bit like, no, I think I've seen enough stuff. To know that this is not bad. I mean, I think I think there's a lot worse that can happen to you. Yeah, don't let me. You're too young. I don't buy that. Uh, those people were unhappy with pranks when they were young. <laughs> so, what's the source of your happiness, Rohan? Um, I, I, great question. I, I think um, you know, I lost my dad and my uncle at a, at a very young age, and and I think there were two 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 very quick. Um, very difficult times, I think, for my family, and I think this is uh, this is one one of those things that you've uh, you've mentioned, right? And I think this is one all happiness uh, researchers agree on that when you have a really sort of a day of reckoning of sorts, while you're you know after a point, you you come out of it. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, I guess, and 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 you come out of it feeling uh, like life is a blessing, and it is. And and I really work hard to remind myself that, and and you know often cues matter. So, you know, every morning I write down my flat five blessings, uh, things I'm grateful for, my bucket list, things that, you know, if I had to, if I had to die by midnight and I think of it like if I have to live today, what, how would I live, right? And uh, what is the commitment to myself? So I write this every day and it's a nice reminder. I think, I think life is really a gift. So, so yeah. yeah that's very good. There's a, there's a, I was reading an article in the local paper here in the Washington Post about there's a wall uh, in Washington, I guess, in several American cities uh, called the Before I Die Wall. Okay. It's sort of like a public bucket list where people just have written in a public place, before I die, I want to, and people then fill in whatever they want to. Yeah. All kinds of things, you know, most of them actually have to do with travel, to places people want to see uh, before they die. And I think, again, that represents, the, the travel impulse represents an impulse to sort of get out of the confines of your life. I yeah. don't think it's just sort of getting on an airplane, that's not that much fun anyway, and going somewhere, but... That's interesting. Uh, one person wrote from, from Ghana, actually, the African country, wrote, I want to swim in buttermilk before I die. Oh, wow. That just seemed, that just seemed odd, but there was something very uh, spontaneous about that. Uh, so I think it is important to remind ourselves of uh, mortality, and, and you, you lost two very important family members uh, at a young age. I'm sure that was very hard, but also probably reminded you of the fragility of life and you know, I think people can have one or two reactions to uh, really crises like that. You know, they could they could either close in and shrink, yeah, or they can grow and expand. And, and it seems that you've done the latter. And I'm really happy to hear that. No, I mean, in this case, I think I think I, I, I thought of that. I think when you were, uh, I think it was Bhutan, right, where uh, where you're reminded yeah. of mortality. And and there is this lovely Doug Hammarskjöld quote that says, uh, "At the end of the day, uh, it's your conception of death that that." Uh, determines how you will live life or it was something along that and I, I find that very yeah. deep uh so yeah. so no it's true and i guess in this case i was lucky with people right so you've written that about india as well everybody has a family and you know we had our friends were right and mom right. <laughs> and grandparents you know, there's, there's no shortage of, of family in india you know, there's a study done comparing uh, the homeless of, of, of calcutta it was called at the time and and uh, a town a city in america in california and the homeless people in India were much happier. Um, they didn't have any more than the homeless people in California. They probably had less. But, of course, they, they had family connections and, and, and human contact. So, yeah. So, Ultimately, I conclude that is our source of happiness is other people. I think connectedness, right? Like, I would think... Uh, I... Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you can be connected to... You know, usually that takes the form of other people. But you can yeah. be connected to your, 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 your 
pet Labrador uh, or your goldfish. You could also be connected to nature and the universe, you know, if you want to get metaphysical about it. But it's it's a different way of looking at happiness. You know, we use the term here in the U.S. fairly uh, commonly. Uh, we talk about our personal happiness. Yeah. As if your happiness really was all personal. <laughs> and it, it's, it's a very telling phrase, and I think it shows how – we sort of uh, sabotage our own happiness by treating it as something that we can just hoard for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, no, I, so I, I don't know if you, I mean, I'm sure you have. There's this very great, a very nice book on happiness by uh, Jonathan Haidt, The Happiness Hypothesis. Yes. And I, yes, and I find it very interesting. The, his hypothesis is that it comes from the between. And I, and I really find that, you know, it seems like it's somewhere in, in the middle of all of this that, like, it seems, you know. Right. Yeah, and, and happiness is uh, it's it's slippery. I mean, the minute you try to stop and say, oh, "I'm happy now," well, then you've lost it. You know, your that happiness is gone because it's it's always a byproduct. You know, it's never like you can't really wake up in the morning and say, "I'm going to be happy today." That's not going to work. But you can wake up and say, oh, "I'm going to show kindness to others," or "I'm going to be appreciative of what I have," or "I'm just going to have fun." That you can do, but happiness is always the byproduct of. of life that you live yeah yeah uh, i just uh, so there's another interesting um, anecdote i heard that uh, life is a bit like an ecg i think if it goes up and down it's normal if it's too high it's a big problem and if it's flat as well you're it's kind of a big problem it's a really big problem <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah yeah i like that that's yeah that's good now so so, flat line. <laughs> so so eric i think i think i think um i think one question is as a writer, um, right? Uh, you know, you, you're pretty much your own man, as you said. You get to decide whether you want to be in a coffee shop for one minute or seven days. How do you, uh, what, how do you self-discipline yourself? I'm sure you have to, and I'm sure you have to organize yourself. Well, in some when way. I go to the places, I always, uh, you know, I, I try to stay focused. I'm trying to answer usually one big question or a few big questions, like, you know. What is happiness? Where is happiness? What is God? That sort of you know, really big questions. And so my travel is always designed to sort of uncover answers to those questions as opposed to just meandering. I think that the day of the sort of travel log, sort of the tradition of Paul Theroux, who's a, an excellent writer, uh, but the, the day of sort of just wandering aimlessly through the streets of Calcutta or wherever, I think are over. The world is pretty well discovered. I mean, we're talking with thousands of miles apart and ocean separates yeah. so we can see each other and we're talking. So technology has shrunk the world that way, but it does not shrunk the cultural differences, I think. And, and really, uh, I think the kind of travel books that still appeal to people are the ones that, that are travel with a purpose. When yeah. you're, you're trying to uncover some sort of answer. Uh, just to give you uh, an example, my, my next book, that I'm, my third book that I'm working on right now is a sort of a geography of genius. That's not the title, but that's the idea. It's how certain places make us feel more creative and how certain places throughout history uh, and still today are very innovative and, and uh, produce a lot of good ideas. They're like incubators of good ideas. And why is that? So I'll be traveling to seven places, seven cities mainly around the world and trying to figure out what's in the air, uh, either in the past or, or currently. Um, so let me ju just ask you, Rohan, do you, uh, where do you feel your, your most creative self? Uh, is it back in Chennai in India or in London or on the tube or someplace like that? Good question. So so in terms of places, right, I've, I've, I think if, if I have to look at significant living, I've lived in Chennai, Singapore, where I studied and spent five years, and then now London. And I would think among the three, I, I would think actually London is is uh, is probably the place I feel most creative. Why do you think that is? Um, you, you know, I, I sometimes draw parallels to to the to the Silicon Valley, which is another place where I find I find myself feeling very creative, and and it's probably the Bay Area as 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 the locals would call it. I I think there's a, there's two things. I think there's a bit of uh, vibrance in the air, and and. And the reason I feel that is, I think diversity helps um, a lot when it comes to sort of uh, feeling and energy. Um, right. I think, yeah, I think of it as diversity, a sense of history. And I don't necessarily mean like a long, like London has that, has history. But I think, but I think the Bay Area has a history of innovation, for example. 
So um, I, I think that helps. Uh, and and yeah. Well, look at a place like uh, Kolkata in, in India. Um, I mean, there's a, a city that most Westerners still, when they hear of it, the name, well, they have to know that it used to be Calcutta, now it's Kolkata. Yeah. Uh, that. Um, they think of Mother Teresa. They think it's yeah. abject poverty, yeah. you know, and human misery. Yeah. But uh, as you probably know, it's you know also the home to Tagore, the great Indian uh, writer and poet, and musician and artist who, who won a Nobel Prize for literature, and Satyajit Ray, the great Indian filmmaker, yeah. and actually a lot of other people. So I'm just wondering if maybe out of the, the messiness of a city yes. like Calcutta, agree. Some creativity arises. No, I agree, and 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 I think that was the third thing that I missed. I think the other thing that I like is 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 I think chaos helps. Um, yeah. And 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 I just mean when it's chaos in the air. Like uh, I, I find that a, a big difference between Singapore and here, for example. Where, There's not a lot of chaos in Singapore, is there? Not at all. It's a uh, it's Switzerland, right? As as we would put it, but. But no, yeah, no, I don't. I don't feel as uh, th there's just something in the air. I think uh, in a more chaotic place. That's why India. Like I find, I find myself very creative back home because of the amount of chaos there is. So in general. Yeah, and yeah. But when you go back home, you. you know, I find this as someone who's traveled, lived abroad. That uh, one of the advantages of living outside of your home country is when you return to your home country, you can see it with fresh eyes, right? Does that happen to you? Absolutely. Um, that, sorry, there's another, I think in quotes, because I do these quotes every morning on a short form blog, but there's one that says, uh, you know, the essence of travel is when you sort of travel around the world and, and come back to come back to where you sort of began your travels and finally recognize it. Uh, you know, I, I sort of... I think it's from T.S. Eliot. It's a yes. Poem, I believe. From him. And uh, yeah, we, we, we've just butchered it, both of us. Yes, I, I have completely butchered it. It's a very beautiful you line. And you, you recognize home for the first time. Yeah. And I think that is one of the great advantages of travel is coming home. Yeah. So, um, speaking of coming home, uh, I'm afraid I have to... I, I have you have five minutes, home, right? But one that has a seven-year-old daughter who I've got to pick up in about 10 minutes from the bus stop. Yeah, so, so I'm going to take exactly about four more minutes. Uh, have you already okay. asked your question? Uh that was my question. Ah, okay, perfect. So, so then I have I have an unrestricted four minutes. So, so I have two yes. questions really. One question is um, routine. So, so you know, I'm I'm exploring sort of routine as a source of happiness. Uh, and I was just curious, what is your experience with it? Do you do you have daily routines that you stick to? Is do these help? Do you wake up at a certain time in the morning? What is your what is your uh, sense on that? Oh boy, well that's a good question. Um... When you're a free spirit, you know, when you're a writer, you actually, you don't have any structure in your life. You have to create the structure. Yeah. And so people think, oh, it's just you're free. You can do whatever you want. In fact, no, I need, I need to pay more attention to uh, the structure in my life than you do. Yeah. Probably, because I don't know if you've been school or you have a job. Yeah. But you have a schedule. Yes. I imagine, right? You've got, you've got to be certain places. Yes. <laughs> I don't really have to be anywhere except to pick up my daughter in a few minutes. Yeah. But other than that, um, I can be anywhere, and that, that is a problem. So I try to create a routine where I, I uh, map out the, the day pretty pretty tightly. Um, I do start the day with a bit of Buddhist meditation uh, to sort of relax, and then I'll do some exercise. And and uh, I, need, I find I need to get out of the house to write. Even though I have this office, lovely office in my home, uh, it's too many distractions, uh, too many reminders of home life. So I go to a, a coffee shop or someplace like that, and uh, I will catch up on emails from readers, people like you and others, and then I will try to block out time to write. And I'll actually use this program on my laptop called Freedom okay. uh, that basically cuts me off on the internet for anywhere from 15 minutes to eight hours. Okay. And I need that discipline yeah. to get offline and to think and to write. I'm also doing a lot of reading now, all kinds of academic books and others about the subject that we just talked about for my next book. So. I, I try to block out the time and, and to actually give myself a routine. I, I think it is important. We, we need structure in our lives, even if we have to create it ourselves. Yeah. Okay. And the final question is, you know, uh, the, the, the reason this was done is it was done for many readers uh, for the well small community in my blog, but in a sense, uh, a huge small, but growing. small, good, exactly small, but growing. Yes. And, and, you know, of people who are looking to be leaders of their own life, looking to be happy, you have sort of a motley bunch, right? What is a message that you would like to pass on to uh, yeah, a bunch of youngsters like me to start with? Um, what is what is what is something that comes to mind? And I, and I don't mean advice. It, it could be anything. Well, I mean, I'll just be 
said youngsters. I mean, I am struck by how many young people, like in, like you in their early twenties, are so damn serious about everything. I mean, they are. They feel like somehow they're behind in life at age twenty three. Like, how can you be behind? They're like, no, I got to take my GMAT and this test, and I got to get into this graduate school. And, and you know, if you look at you know the, the great people, uh, Einstein and others. Um, they were, they were terrible at school. Uh, they were terrible students. And they would goof off or do what appeared to be goofing off. So I guess my best message, if you want to call it that, is just like, don't take things so seriously. Because if you lose that sense of playfulness, you know, of, of life being an activity of play and of fun, uh, what the Thai is called, saduk, right? If you lose that, you've lost everything. Because... As long as work feels like work, you're probably not going to do anything great. Uh, when it, it is play, then it's not a burden. It takes on a lightness to it. So just chill out. Have some fun. That is amazing, Eric. Hey, thank you so much. I mean, thank you.